everybody knows you in Bakersfield, but just for those that don't know, you, uh, 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 you've you been a weatherman here for how long in Bakersfield, California? Well, for six years now, but I was here from 1990 until 2009, but I was gone in Connecticut for um, four years. Okay. And so I've been a meteorologist since uh, 1976. Okay. And I was a weather observer in the Air Force before that. Very good, very good. And, and, and we got this conversation started like in an email. I told you I was, I, I was a pilot. And I was concerned about this because an organization I'm involved with is into it, and I don't believe in it. So anyway, I'll just roll with the questions, okay? Because you said you were a meteorologist. Uh, your point of view to determine the prediction for contrails, you said, could be used, uh, predicted through the use of nanograms. Explain that. Uh, oh, nomograms. Uh, nomograms. No, nomograms. Yeah. Yeah. That's just um, it is. A, it has an x and a y coordinate, and uh, based on temperature and uh, pressure, that's how you can tell uh, whether or not it's likely or unlikely that that uh, contrails would form. And contrails are actually ice crystals, basically ice fog that right. forms at extremely low temperatures, generally less than minus 22. Minus 22, according to cloud physics, is the halfway point. A, a droplet of water will either be liquid or ice. Fifty percent of the time, it'll be ice. Fifty percent uh, liquid at minus 22. Colder than minus 22, it rapidly becomes all ice. So you can have liquid water in a below freezing environment at temperatures down to about minus 22. Hence, we get a lot of icing on aircraft. But below that, you get the the ice crystals and the ice fog. So up at high elevations where the uh, planes fly. 30,000, 40,000 feet temperatures range from 60 to maybe 100 below zero, that's where um, ice fog will form. And the colder it is, the more likely ice fog will form. But planes sometimes fly at, at uh, elevations that are a little lower than that, altitudes lower. And when that takes place, then you don't get contrails. Or it can be extremely cold. It could be the middle of the winter, and you'll get very cold the air at lower elevations, and then you'll get more contrails. What's the lowest, do you think, a, a contrail could form? Well, it can form on the ground in Antarctica. Oh, sure. It does that all the time. In fact, oh, sure. the last time I checked, it was 72 below zero on the ground at, uh, at Abinson Scott. Okay. Um, is it possible to see a contrail, and you'd see it, and you see a plane fly above it that would be another commercial jetliner, and a plane flying above a certain level, the conditions of, of contrails at a higher altitude would not be... Uh, ripe to form a contrail, but lower altitude would? Sure, sure, because uh, because quite often the air actually gets warmer as you go up into the stratosphere. Oh, really? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. In fact, you, you the, the temperature will go to a certain very cold level, and then it actually rises above that. That's called the tropopause. You go from the troposphere, where we live, mm -hmm. to the stratosphere above it, and the temperature actually goes up. The reason it goes up is because of uh, ozone, in the atmosphere, which actually absorbs ultraviolet light from the sun and mm. actually resonates at a certain frequency and gives out heat. That's why it actually warms up above a certain level. And if uh, aircraft are flying in that level, uh, the chance for uh, formation of, of uh, contrail is actually diminished. So describe a situation where you'd see a, a relevant amount of contrails already existing and lingering, and then, and then another jet would fly through the same altitude or thereabouts that proximity and wouldn't have a contrail for some reason other than it be a different type of jet engine. So you would see it above or below. What, the, there what? may be something to the jet engine type and the hydrocarbon exhaust and the composition of all that. Uh, that gets into the, uh, the, the real details of all this. But uh, the temperature can change at these uh, altitudes and elevations uh, right. horizontally. You, you can get warmer advecting in, right. and that'll change things uh, rather quickly. Right, up at Tehachapi, uh, 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 I can show you on my laptop, I photographed a bunch of them, and they were sputtering and starting and ending and, and doing all kinds of things up there. So people see that as like a smoke coming out the back of these commercial jetliners, and it's or they uh, uh, nickname it an aerosol spray, and they think that there's some other container on board the military aircraft or aboard the commercial jetliner, and they think that that is spraying. And it's just all these photographs and all these, uh, you know, the, the the clouds in general. I've been telling people, and you can tell me whether I'm correct or not. You'll see a contrail, and it's persistent on generally a day with other high clouds per se. There, that that will be a day 
that the upper atmosphere is primed to make these other cirrus clouds or uh, alto cirrus clouds yeah. and you're going to see a jetliner fly through that atmosphere compress the air heat up the air that the trigger point is close to making that cloud anyway and the jetliner this triggers that off am i close sure when when the cirrus clouds or cirrus stratus high level ice crystal clouds are forming generally the environment is uh, favorable for for contrail formation as well and uh, really the exhaust the hydrocarbon exhaust from a jet engine it just provides the um, the nucleus the nuclei for uh, clouds to develop and clouds to form. The ice crystals will sublime onto those little hydrocarbon particles and that's how these things happen. So if it's already happening with regular natural clouds, right. it's just as likely uh, to happen with... Uh, so you've got yeah. some more substance to work with. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you've got more substance to work with to make the clouds. Here you have aerosols, which okay. is airborne solids. Okay, aerosol. okay. E explain that sublimation, which is a, a uh, an element that skips the liquid state and goes directly like a dry ice to a cloud. And, uh, this, right, and, uh, uh, that's what happens at these very cold uh, That's what we're seeing. That's what we're seeing. Yeah, there, there is no liquid. It's too cold for liquid. Right. Uh, water can only exist either as vapor or ice at those temperatures and pressures. The pressure comes into it too. It's not just temperature. It changes a little bit with uh, different pressures. Right. But in those uh, very high elevations and altitudes, it's all uh, ice. And so what happens is that the uh, the water vapor in the air uh, sublimes into ice. It never goes instantly. Through. Instantly. Yeah. In instantly. And it goes the other way too. It goes from solid to gas. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, and, it when it, and when it goes from gas and forms the cloud, it actually releases heat. Heat is actually released into the atmosphere. Right. And so if there is um, a lot of contrail a lot of contrails being formed, the atmosphere actually warms up a little bit because of the latent heat of, uh, in this case, sublimation. Mm -hmm. And it goes the other way. When it evaporates, you know, and goes from, mm -hmm. from uh, ice crystals to just vapor, uh, it gets cooler. Okay. There's actually this, this latent heat that has to do with the chemical uh, structure of mm -hmm. the water. So